Back in the days of yore, when the tender age of 18 was but a distant mirage and the innocence of childhood was still clung to, my parents decided to part ways, opting for the solemn ceremony of divorce. In the grand settlement that followed, a curious agreement was forged. My dear mother, in all her wisdom, claimed custody of the esteemed Labrador retriever, while my father, in a move that would shape the trajectory of my upbringing, emerged victorious in acquiring yours truly. A decade passed, marked by an unfortunate hiatus in my interactions with the maternal figure, until a mere two moons ago when she, overcome with a sense of longing and perhaps a tinge of remorse, reached out to me. Her confession unveiled a peculiar twist in the narrative. She missed me dearly but, paralyzed by shame stemming from the peculiar arrangement of our familial split, had refrained from making contact. The reunion unfolded, and in a moment of familial bonding, I introduced my current paramour, aged 18, to the long-lost matriarch. Alas, a misstep on my part exposed the dormant tensions within my soul. My beloved inquired about the palpable tension in my demeanor during maternal interactions, prompting a candid divulgence of the custody quagmire. Upon learning the unsettling truth, my intrepid girlfriend seized the reins of communication and, in a bold maneuver, placed a call to my mother. The ensuing dialogue, as per my mother's vivid recollection, unfolded as a cacophony of reproach, with my girlfriend unleashing a five-minute tirade denouncing my maternal progenitor as nothing short of excrement. In the aftermath, my mother, rather than harboring sympathy, chided me for my indiscretion, contending that I should have foreseen the inevitable embarrassment. Am I, in this convoluted saga, the harbinger of idiocy? The internet denizens, in their infinite wisdom, offered varied perspectives. Some, in their acerbic digital discourse, asserted that the rekindled maternal interest stemmed from the demise of the loyal canine companion, while others, with a touch of cynicism, cast doubt on the authenticity of maternal remorse. A consensus emerged that my mother's embarrassment was not my cross to bear, and I was encouraged to craft my own narrative, unbridled by maternal influence. In this tapestry of familial discord, the role of my 18-year-old girlfriend was scrutinized. While some advocated for the sanctity of personal boundaries, others praised her audacious intervention, a testament to her care and concern for my well-being. The debate oscillated between the girlfriend's overreach and the mother's transgressions, leaving me, the hapless protagonist, at the center of this intricate web of familial complexity. The wisdom imparted ranged from acknowledging the frailty of parental bonds to the importance of guarding one's narrative with utmost care. Opinions diverged on the forgiving nature of a child abandoned at the tender age of eight, with some advocating for a staunch refusal to forgive, and others contemplating the possibility of redemption. As the digital echoes of advice and critique reverberated in the virtual realm, the final verdict remained elusive. The saga continued, and the pen of my fate remained poised, awaiting the next chapter in the chronicles of familial tumult. In the grand theater of familial dynamics, the resolute stance of the girlfriend, a beacon of unwavering support, serves as a stark reminder of the intrinsic value of genuine care and concern. The sage advice reverberates through the digital corridors, urging the narrator to eschew the recently rediscovered maternal figure and, instead, embrace the steadfast presence of the girlfriend. The assertion gains strength from the conviction that the girlfriend, in her spontaneous reaction, showcased a level of empathy and protective instinct surpassing the tepid response of the long-lost mother. The suggestion lingers in the virtual air, resonating with the notion that familial bonds extend beyond blood ties, intertwining with the threads of companionship and understanding. In the parallel narrative, a tale unfolds within the crucible of a 12-hour work shift, a laborious endeavor undertaken by the husband to sculpt a future paved with financial stability. The backdrop is adorned with the tapestry of a familial chronicle, featuring a diverse ensemble comprising a tween, a pre-tween, a kindergartner, and an infant. The script takes an unforeseen turn when the pregnant protagonist, navigating the tumultuous waters of impending motherhood, finds herself thrust into the confines of a condemned apartment. Mold and mice, silent assailants, cast a shadow over the unsuspecting family, prompting a temporary refuge in the transient abode of a hotel. The protagonist's narrative, pregnant with complexity, introduces a quandary as the husband, laboring under the weight of financial responsibility, procures a residence two days prior to the imminent birth. A plea for the sanctuary of the maternal home is dismissed, 
Echoing the refrain of a relentless work schedule and the allure of a residence adjacent to a bosom buddy, the stage is set for a life in cramped quarters, a two-bedroom haven hosting a quintet at a monthly expense of $1,600, a figure that stretches the boundaries of economic sensibility. As the curtains rise on this domestic tableau, the protagonist unveils the intricacies of her struggle, a delicate dance between motherhood and the constraints of limited space. A cacophony of discomfort echoes through the narrative the absence of a dining table, children relegated to couch-bound meals, and the constant intrusion of the friend's offspring, a clamorous chorus of youthful exuberance. The riverfront locale, paradoxically idyllic, becomes a source of concern, the outdoors transformed into a realm shadowed by mistrust. The protagonist, a weaver of words, recounts her attempts to articulate the tribulations, only to be met with assurances that the ordeal is but a fleeting moment in the grand tapestry of life. The husband, wielding the shield of financial prudence, remains steadfast, disregarding the mental and physical toll exacted upon the narrator. A crescendo of resentment, a symphony of doubts, threatens the foundation of a 14-year union, a relationship previously untouched by the dissonance now echoing through the corridors of familial discord. In a climactic moment, the protagonist, weary from the ceaseless demands of motherhood, seeks respite passing the torch of parental duty to the husband. A breath of fresh air beckons, a brief interlude in the relentless narrative of domesticity. The tale, poised on the precipice of uncertainty, leaves the audience yearning for resolution, for a denouement that transcends the present discord and steers the narrative towards a semblance of harmony. Upon stepping into the embrace of solitude, a fleeting moment of respite awaited me, only to be swiftly disrupted as my husband's friend, upon spotting me traversed the distance to initiate a conversation. Inquiring about the whereabouts of my spouse, he revealed a pressing need for a trip to the store, extending an invitation to my husband, who, in turn, acquiesced to the request. The scant thirty seconds of coveted alone time slipped through my grasp, igniting a surge of frustration within me compelling me to confront my husband with an ultimatum. In the crucible of my emotional upheaval, I presented him with two choices. To extricate us from the claustrophobic confines that threatened my mental well-being or to witness my departure back to the sanctuary of my mother's abode. His response, delivered with an air of perplexity, articulated a lack of comprehension regarding my expectations, coupled with an assertion that the scarcity of available alternatives rendered him powerless. Undeterred, I implored him to navigate the labyrinth of housing predicaments and devise a solution forthwith. Yet, his subsequent rejoinder unveiled a contrasting sentiment, accusing me of imposing undue pressure, citing his own struggles and the weight of familial responsibility. The disconnect between our perspectives laid bare, culminating in his proclamation that he devotes significant mental bandwidth to the matter at hand. My resolve, however, remained unyielding as I found myself incapable of enduring the ongoing ordeal. A pertinent detail surfaced through an edit, dispelling concerns about financial constraints, for I possessed gainful employment, and our monetary worries were unfounded. Puzzlement arose regarding the husband's relentless pursuit of overtime, ostensibly to secure financial stability. The crux of the matter, it appeared, lay not in the realm of financial insufficiency but rather in the elusive quest for alternative housing. The narrative unfolded against a backdrop of familial dynamics, where the allure of maternal solace clashed with the husband's reluctance to inhabit shared spaces. An ironic twist revealed discussions of a potential joint residence with his mother contradicting his aversion to communal living. The internet jury, in their digital wisdom, absolved the narrator of idiocy, affirming the legitimacy of her concerns and endorsing the potential retreat to the maternal haven. In a parallel saga, a tale of nuptial aspirations painted the canvas of anticipation. A year-long journey awaited its culmination in a Hawaiian retreat, a symbol of conjugal celebration. Unexpectedly, the brother, in a surprising interjection, sought to integrate himself and his partner into the sacred pilgrimage. The narrator, disarmed by the sudden proposition, rebuffed the intrusion, emphasizing the personal nature of the excursion. As opinions swirled in the virtual sphere, a prevailing sentiment emerged, echoing the narrator's autonomy in shaping the narrative of her matrimonial journey. 
The brothers' unexpected inclusion, perceived as an encroachment upon the sanctity of the anniversary getaway, garnered empathetic support for the narrator's right to safeguard the intimacy of the occasion. The digital consensus, while diverse, coalesced around the theme of individual agency, heralding the narrator's prerogative to define the contours of her celebratory voyage. In the convoluted tale of familial dynamics, a trick was played on the narrator, who anticipated a sacred journey to Hawaii with her spouse, only to have her plans disrupted by the unexpected interjection of her brother. This supposed trip, intended to be the couple's honeymoon, was proposed to be transformed into a communal affair, as the brother and his boyfriend sought to partake in the shared experience of a double couple's honeymoon. Faced with this audacious proposition, the narrator, in a moment of candid objection, conveyed the sentiment that if her brother desired a honeymoon experience, he should embark on a separate journey rather than co-opting hers. In the aftermath of this objection, the brother unleashed a torrent of criticism, accusing the narrator of selfishness for not willingly sharing this intimate experience with him. The crux of his argument rested on the assertion that the country's stance on gay marriages would forever deny him the opportunity to partake in the authentic experience of a honeymoon. Remarkably, even the parental figures, with the mother taking a prominent role, aligned themselves with the brother's perspective, creating a familial alliance that seemingly undermined the narrator's right to autonomy. The narrative takes a dramatic turn as the narrator, fueled by a sense of frustration and a desire to protect the sanctity of her honeymoon, contemplates the subversive act of providing her brother with false information about the location. This Machiavellian stratagem, designed to thwart any possibility of interference, is born out of a desperation to salvage the intimacy of the planned celebration. The narrator grapples with the weight of familial expectations and contemplates this unorthodox approach as a means of preserving the essence of her honeymoon. As the digital jury weighs in on the unfolding drama, a consensus emerges, characterizing the brothers' insistence on co-opting the honeymoon as entitled and selfish. Advice flows in, advocating for secrecy regarding the true location, urging the narrator to protect her intimate moments from familial intrusion. The notion of treating the situation as if on the run, shielding the details of the honeymoon plans, gains traction as a viable strategy to navigate this familial quagmire. In a parallel narrative, a subplot unfurls, delving into the narrator's personal challenges, including post-traumatic stress disorder triggered by the sound of crying babies. The complexities of familial relationships intertwine with the impending arrival of a new member, as the older sister, unexpectedly pregnant, decides to keep the baby and opts to remain in the familial abode. This revelation, layered with emotional nuances, adds yet another dimension to the intricate tapestry of the narrator's life. Embroiled in a postgraduate program, and given our commitment to education, we deemed it fit to support her endeavors in the same way we did for them when they pursued their undergraduate degrees. My wife and I have been consistent in our belief that education is an invaluable investment, and as long as we are capable, we want to contribute to the academic pursuits of our children. In response to our decision, both our sons expressed discontent, contending that our actions are tantamount to spoiling our daughter. Their argument pivots on the notion of equality, positing that all siblings should receive identical treatment. A point of contention has emerged within the familial unit, as our sons vocalize their displeasure over what they perceive as preferential treatment. In attempting to justify our decision, I reiterated that the divergence in financial contributions stems from the distinct nature of their educational pursuits. While our sons opted for undergraduate degrees leading them into the workforce, our daughter embarked on a postgraduate journey, a unique academic endeavor that warranted additional financial support. This distinction, we believe, justifies the differential treatment and aligns with our ethos of fostering educational growth. The familial discord, however, persists with our sons adamantly asserting that uniform treatment should prevail. Their insistence on parity permeates the conversation, challenging the foundation of our decision and raising questions about the perceived fairness within our family dynamics. As the digital jury weighs in on this familial debate, opinions vary, with some asserting the validity of our commitment to educational support and others championing the cause of equality among siblings. The narrative unfolds against a backdrop of conflicting values, with our sons advocating for a sense of egalitarianism while we, as parents, grapple with the nuances of individualized support tailored to the unique needs of each child. 
In the midst of this familial crossroads, the fundamental question looms large. Is our decision to financially support our daughter's postgraduate pursuits a justifiable investment in her education, or does it, in the eyes of our sons, amount to an act of favoritism that undermines the principle of equal treatment within the family unit? Paths in life have diverged, with their daughter opting to pursue higher education, a choice that distinguishes her academic journey from that of her brothers. In response to the perceived discrepancy, the eldest son contends that fairness dictates the establishment of a college fund for potential future grandchildren, a proposal met with swift rejection from the patriarch. Firm in his stance, the father asserts that the responsibility for their grandchildren lies squarely with his sons, echoing the sentiment that just as his kids are his responsibility, their offspring are the responsibility of their respective parents. This unwavering declaration underscores the belief that each nuclear family unit should independently navigate the financial terrain of their children's lives. The tension intensifies as the sons, discontented with the allocation of financial resources, accuse the parents of favoritism, labeling the daughter as the golden child. This accusation, far from novel, is revealed to have historical roots, with past grievances surfacing in the form of a teenage era dispute. The sons, it seems, felt slighted as teenagers when the daughter, purportedly, received more financial support for her shopping endeavors. As accusations fly, the father stands resolute, maintaining that financial decisions are made based on individual needs and choices rather than a bias towards a perceived golden child. The narrative, however, reveals a complex web of familial dynamics where financial support intertwines with perceptions of favoritism, leading to a cacophony of discontent. In the midst of the familial discord, external voices weigh in questioning the father's objectivity and urging a reconsideration of the perceived imbalance. The contention arises that the daughter's financial support, particularly in the realm of shopping, may have contributed to the perception of favoritism, as the sons contend they did not receive equal financial backing. The father's response, steeped in a belief in the autonomy of financial decisions and an assertion of the daughter's agency in seeking support, underscores a fundamental tension within the family unit. The concept of fairness, as viewed through the lens of equal financial support, clashes with the father's conviction that financial decisions are shaped by individual choices and needs. As the familial saga unfolds, the central question lingers, is financial fairness synonymous with equality? or does each child's unique journey merit individualized support, even if it gives rise to perceptions of favoritism? The patriarch's stance, unyielding in its defense of autonomy, contends that financial decisions are not a one-size-fits-all proposition, further fueling the familial debate on what constitutes fair treatment within the family unit.